this evening I'm going to talk about on the topic of uh, purification. Uh, and uh, the reason I want to talk about this is because this is like a lead-up topic to meditation practice. If you want your meditation to really take off, uh, to really be powerful, then purifying yourself is actually the foundation for meditation to actually work 100% work fully. Uh, and the reason for that is I talked a little bit, uh, not quite recently, about mindfulness here. Uh, and this is really like the pivotal point in meditation practice, is this thing we know as mindfulness. When you have mindfulness, uh, meditation starts to work almost all by itself. Uh, and if you haven't got that mindfulness, actually meditation is often very difficult. Uh, it's actually a hard thing to do. Uh, and um, the reason for that is because mindfulness... Uh, first of all, mindfulness means that you are present in the here and now. Uh, and not only are you present, but you have a certain clarity about your presence. Uh, it's like you're here. It's like you can choose uh, what you want to do. You can choose what meditation object you want to pursue. Uh, you can choose whether you want to attend to this or that. Uh, you can choose whether you want to become angry, so to speak, or not. Uh, it's like you have a sense of control of your mind for the first time. Uh, Mindfulness in the Pali language is often called an indriya. An indriya means like a, is often translated as a controlling faculty. And it's controlling in the sense that you have a feeling that you are in charge of your mind. Usually, our mind is in charge of like the defilements of anger or greed or whatever it is. It's in charge by all the sensory input from the outside. It's in charge by the... Uh, uh, past habits and things that we have. Uh, all of these things tend to drive our mind. Uh, but when mindfulness is there, when you are really present, for the first time, you feel, I am actually in charge. I can attend to whatever I want to attend to. And what a wonderful thing that is, uh, to have a sense of actually being in charge of yourself. And of course, what that means, uh, the moment you are in charge of yourself, it means that you can attend to whatever object you want to attend to. So if you want to watch the breath, you actually can watch the breath uh, because you have that controlling faculty of mindfulness inside of you. Uh, if you don't have the mindfulness there, uh, if you don't have the ability to apply your mind when, wherever you want, uh, of course, watching the breath is going to be very, very hard. Uh, and to be able to give rise to this mindfulness, and this is, I think, where Buddhism has its great strength. Buddhism is always about conditionality. Uh, it's about how things come into being. Uh, so we come to understand what are the causes, uh, what are the reasons why mindfulness actually comes to exist. Uh, and what Buddhism says uh, is that what you need for mindfulness to actually be there is uh, purity of heart. Uh, that is the most important thing. You need morality. Uh, you need virtue. You need ethics. Uh, you need a mind that has a certain degree of purity. Uh, and if you think about it, it's actually very obvious why this is the case. I've talked about this here before, but I think it's probably worthwhile uh, repeating again. It's very obvious why that is the case. If you are angry with something, if you are irritated about something, uh, essentially uh, you're in the past. Uh, anger, irritation, negativity is always about something that happened before. Uh, so your mind is dragged into the past by that negativity uh. Uh, if you have a desire for something, uh, desire is always about the future, right? Uh, there's something you want, there's something you haven't got now. You're looking into the future. This is what craving and desire is all about. It's about the future, what you haven't got now that you may apply or may get in the future. Uh, so these two things, anger and desire, or not necessarily even anger, but slight irritation uh, and the slightest desire, take us out of the present moment, away from mindfulness, uh, and it doesn't take much. Just a little bit of that desire, a little bit of the irritation is enough to blur your ability to actually stay right here, right now. And that's why this purification process is so important, because it helps us to overcome these problems. And what you will find is that once you actually overcome the anger, once you overcome the desire, then usually all the rest of the hindrances also tend to fall away at the same time. So these are really the two important issues. And then uh, you find over time, you do the purification, whatever it requires, you find that your mindfulness starts to brighten up. Every time you go on a retreat, you find something has happened since last time. So this is 
uh, what I want to talk about in a little bit more depth this time, about the process of purification that we need to do uh, in order to uh, you know, gradually move towards greater mindfulness. It's a very important part uh, of the Buddhist path. This is basically all of what the daily practice is all about, uh, how to uh, purify ourselves. And there's two aspects uh, you could say to this purification. Uh, and one is like the negative aspect, uh, where what we do is actually overcome the negative tendencies of the mind. Uh, and that, of course, is very important. Uh, and then there is a positive aspect, which I think often is not talked enough about. Uh, but a positive aspect is actually to develop the good qualities inside of us. Uh, this is equally important. Uh, so both of these go together, the overcoming of the negative and uh, the actually working to, on the positive aspects of, of the mind. So first of all, let's, let's talk a little bit about overcoming the negative. This is again the topic that I have uh, spoken about it before and many others no doubt have spoken about this as well. Uh, but I think it is worthwhile, this is the sort of thing which is worthwhile repeating almost Ad nausea, ad nausea, so to speak, because it's so important. So if you feel bored, then I think that's, that's probably okay. So sorry about that, but that's the way, yeah, the way, the way I like to do this. So, and essentially, of course, the most important part of the negative states of mind is anger, irritation, negativity of mind. So how can we overcome this in daily life? And I want to talk about a few of the methods for overcoming these things. Uh, and please remember that when we talk about these methods, uh, this is something you have to do over and over again to actually make it work. Uh, everything in Buddhism is about developing things, about working on things. Uh, and that development happens over time. Uh, it's not something which happens just like that. You use it once and it's done. Uh, it's something that you need to think about again and again and again. And then gradually, uh, your mind changes and you start to look at things in a new way. It's interesting, sometimes people ask, well, why is it that it is so hard to overcome the defilements of the mind? Why is it so difficult not to be angry? Why is it so hard not to have a sense of loving kindness towards people and, and compassion all the time? Why is it so difficult? And the reason why it is so hard is because we have very powerful habits of mind. And it is these habits that it makes it so difficult to turn direction and actually look in a new way. These are often habits that maybe you have take with you, you have, that have come with you from past lives perhaps, things that have been imprinted in your mind very firmly and very strongly in this life. And because like, it's almost like the circuitry of the brain or the, or the mind, if you like, whatever it is, has been kind of set in a certain way. And now you have to redo the whole circuitry and start to do things afresh and look at things in a new way. The habits are very powerful. Uh, and I'm sure if you think about it, you know that this is true. If you think about sometimes you are in a certain situation, there's a certain, we all have you know, certain people that sometimes irritate us a bit, right? Uh, and sometimes you, you know that this person now is about to say something that irritates, might irritate me. Uh, and just the thought of that is already <laughs> irritating sometimes, isn't it? Uh, and this is the problem. This is the habit, right, in the mind. We know that this is going to happen. This is the situation which is difficult. And already we start to get upset just by that knowledge. So this is the habit. And this is why it is so important to, to uh, develop the opposite again and again uh, with a lot of emphasis. So the first thing, the first way, and I think this is a very powerful way of overcoming that negative mind which finds fault in the world, uh, and uh, becomes upset and angry with things. Uh, and this is to remind yourself that so often, almost always, uh, when you become upset at somebody else, or even, even more so a certain situation, uh, usually it is completely counterproductive. It doesn't work. It has absolutely no effect whatsoever. Uh, in a traffic situation, you come to a red light, uh, and you are late for something, and you get upset. Oh, no, not, not that red light again. Uh, and of course, you know that it doesn't, you know, you can get as upset as you like. It's not going to make any difference for that red light. Or in so many situations in life are just like that. They're like red light situations where your anger makes absolutely no difference. So remind yourself of that. Why am I getting upset for it? It's absolutely pointless. This is the way things are. I can't change this. Anger is not going to work. In fact, all it does is make me more miserable, makes life unbearable. So why on earth am I getting angry at a situation which is not going to change due to my anger? 
And what you start to realize when you actually reflect on this issue again and again, you start to realize that most situations in life are red light situations. Even in cases of other people uh, doing something which is wrong, sometimes you think if I get angry with them, they will change. Will they really change if you get angry? Uh, chances are they won't change at all uh, if you get angry. Nothing will really, usually it's the other way around. If you get angry, they get even more stubborn uh, and even less willing to listen to what you have to say, right? Uh, this is at least my experience. Anger doesn't usually actually function at all. Uh, so instead of getting angry, instead, realize that almost all situations in life are red light situations. Uh, the light is not going to change because they get angry. It's not going to make any difference. Uh, you might as well just accept the situation as is. Okay, this is not nice. This is painful. It's difficult. It's problematic. It's going to cause me problems. But there's nothing I can do. Uh, relax, sit back, take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, it's fine. Uh, and then... Gradually, gradually, stage by stage, day by day, act by act, you start to sink in that actually anger doesn't work. It's not going to make any difference. And then gradually you overcome that old habit of getting angry in these situations. But you've got to apply yourself. You really have to apply yourself again and again and again. And it does eventually change. This is a very simple, very simple thing, very simple technique, but very, very powerful as well. So please keep that one in mind. That is the first one I personally like to use. And when I talk about these things, usually I talk about things that I use in my own practice that I find work. If I don't use it myself, I try not to talk so much about it because it becomes too theoretical in that case. Another thing which I sometimes use in my own practice to overcome any negativity that may arise is to remind myself if somebody treats me in a bad way, if somebody says, them, says something I don't like to hear, if somebody is unreasonable or whatever, and it's very rare, one of the wonderful things about being a Buddhist monk, people usually treat you very nicely, at least in Buddhist circles. So you travel around the Buddhist world from Buddhist center to Buddhist center, it's great. Sometimes if you venture outside of Buddhist centers, it can be a bit more challenging. But generally speaking, people treat you very, very well as a Buddhist monk. And that is one of the wonderful things uh, about being a Buddhist monastic. Yeah. But still, sometimes it is difficult. You know, you go outside somewhere, people don't understand who you are as a Buddhist monk. Yeah. Uh, they think you are some kind of freak or some kind of dodgy character. Yeah. And they give you a hard time as a consequence. That's just the way things are. Yeah. And then I remind myself that it's never actually personal. Yeah. It's never about me and them. Yeah. Even sometimes, if it is somebody you know, for example, I recently went back and visited my family and my parents, and because you have so much past in common, it's almost guaranteed that sometimes you will irritate each other, right? But again, it's not personal. It's never personal. Why? Because when people do something, when people say something that is maybe wrong, and you feel that it's actually directed towards you, it isn't really directed towards you. What is happening is that causes and conditions are coming into place that make that person act in that particular way. Nothing about you. If it had been another person in your place at that time, which had roughly the same character as you had, they would have been copying that problem instead, instead of you. So it's not about you. It's about the situation, about the other person. And when you take about the sense of this being personal, then you take away so much of the problem. If somebody else treats somebody you don't know badly, okay, you might think it's unfair, you might think it's unreasonable, uh, but normally you don't get all that angry if somebody else is getting the hard time. But if it's you, you get really upset. You think, this is not right, this is not the way it should be. Remember, it's not personal, it's not about you. And when you remember that, uh, it's actually about the other person. Uh, it's about the person who is saying or doing this. Uh, then straight away, uh, it actually starts to disappear. It's not about me. Okay, great. And I don't have to get angry then, right? What a wonderful thing that is. So that is a second way. And I, again, you've got to experiment with some of these things. You will find that different people work with different methods. Maybe that everything I say today makes absolutely no sense to you whatsoever. That's fine. You find your own method. Of course, this is what part of what Buddhism is all about. We all need to find our own methods at the end of the day because we all 
uh, work a little bit differently here. But this is just to give you some input in a sense. Another way which I find is sometimes is quite useful to overcome these sort of problems uh, is that when somebody uh, does something again that is unreasonable or bad or not, not nice, uh, and of course very often when we get angry it has to do with other people, right? Other people are often the problem. Uh, so when somebody does something wrong, instead uh, of getting angry because they have acted in a bad and wrong way, uh, feel instead what it feels like. Uh, when somebody treats you unfairly, when somebody treats you wrongly, what is the feeling here? And of course, what you feel when somebody does something that is wrong, you feel a sense of pain inside of you. This is not nice to be treated in the wrong way. And when you actually focus on the pain, when you focus on what it feels like to be treated in this way, then you are experiencing reality. You are experiencing the world. This is what it's like to be a human being. Human beings have these sort of experiences. There's always going to be somebody out there who treats you in the wrong way. There's always going to be somebody out there who says the wrong thing. There's always going to be somebody out there who is stupid and ill-informed or whatever it is that we think they are. It's always going to be like that. So experience what it's like to live in that world. And when you experience what it's like to be in this world, then you actually start to understand something about suffering. You start to understand something about what it's like to be human, or what it's like to be an animal, to what it's like to be a being. So instead of, when, if you get angry, it's like you're covering over the actual experience of life with your anger, with your irritation. And it's almost like you're projecting that experience back to the other person through the anger. But instead feel what life is like. And you actually learn something about life that way. Feel. And then when you understand this is life, this is what it's like, I can't escape it, there is no way out of this, a sense of compassion arises for yourself. This is what it's like to be me. It's actually painful sometimes, not always painful. Sometimes it's joyous, sometimes it's happy, often it's just neutral, sometimes it's painful. I can't do anything about this pain. And allow a sense of compassion and sympathy arise for yourself. This is what it's like to be me here. Okay. And then, when you have a sense of compassion for yourself, because you know that there is no escape from this problem, there's no way of getting out of it, then you can also start to have compassion for the person who is maybe treating you not in the right way. Because you know that he is also, or she is also, part of this problem, part of this world, in the same position as you are. And the compassion can also go back to that person. No anger is required. Just compassion is required in these situations. And what a wonderful thing that is, if you can do that. You can transform an actual potential difficult situation, transform it in to compassion and kindness instead. And a wonderful thing that is. Because often we react so habitually in a negative way. Gradually, gradually, you can change the way you deal with these things. So that is uh, just a few ways of how to deal with problems that arise in life. Uh, and that is very important. And again, I would say to you, if you use these methods, uh, make sure that you use them again and again and again. You reflect on these things again and again. Uh, don't just do it once or twice and think it's going to work. Uh, these things become powerful when you do it over time, never again and again and again. And after a while, you will start to see uh, that this actually becomes part of who you are. It becomes part of the view that you have of the world. And when you have this view of the world, it becomes a habit, and you start to act in these ways naturally. And you can see the change in yourself over the months, over the years. And when you see it, it's such a wonderful thing, because it's like your character is actually changing. It's being molded, but in a beautiful way. So keep on doing it, and then see what happens. So that is like overcoming some of the negative emotions, now I want to come to the other aspect, which actually is the developing of the positive instead. And this is sometimes, I think, something which is forgotten in Buddhism. We talk about keeping the five precepts, we talk about not doing what is bad. But actually, a very important part of this path is doing what is, excuse me, doing what is good very important part of the path. And if you really want to purify yourself, if you really want to create a, a beautiful kind of inner 
you, a beautiful mind. And this is so much part of actually the path. And of course, an important part of this is what I was trying to do before during the med meditation is to do a bit of metta. Metta is this loving kindness, the well-wishing, the goodwill towards other beings, a very important part of it. But for actually for this metta meditation to work, you need, first of all, a foundation in metta in daily life. You need to actually have that metta in how you interact with people in daily life. Then, when you have that metta in daily life, when you interact with people in the right way, then you will find that the meditation itself starts to take off. This is a very important part of it, because it starts to change your perception. You start to look at people in a new way, and then you bring that back into your meditation practice, and you get these beautiful feelings start to arise. So how can we bring this metta into our daily life? And it's actually it's very simple. It's just to remind yourself that when you have a chance, when you have the opportunity to do something kind to somebody else, take the opportunity every single time. Never waste the chance, never waste the opportunity to do something beautiful to another person. Of course, sometimes it's difficult and you have to try to think differently to be able to do that. But try again and again and again, always, to do kind acts, kind acts of compassion and kindness to others. And you will find that if you uh, start looking in your ordinary life, you will find that there are so many opportunities to do small little acts of kindness. I'm not talking about now the big things. The big acts are, are fine. Of course, you can do big acts of kindness. But really, what really is important are the small little things in daily life. Allowing somebody in front of you in the car, you know, instead of getting a road rage, you get road kindness. What a wonderful thing it is to have road kindness rather than road rage. <laughs> so have road kindness and allow somebody in in front of you. Wow, what a wonderful thing that is. Do something, you know, in the, just in ordinary life. Uh, do something kind. Somebody needs a hand. Give them a hand. Somebody needs to lift something heavy. Help them to lift something heavy here. Uh, if you have, if you're sitting in the office, you can share. So often we can share things with the people around us. Share things with, some, with somebody you don't normally share something with. Uh, uh, also, uh, one of the very powerful things of kindness uh, is to actually be kind to strangers. Uh, why is it so powerful to be kind to strangers? Because very often the family members we have or the office work members we have, uh, there's always a certain vested interest in being kind to these people. We expect something in return. If we are kind to the office workers, we expect they will be kind to us back. If we are kind to the family members, we expect a certain return. If you are kind to a perfect stranger, somebody you may never ever see again, uh, there's absolutely no vested interest. There's no desire. Uh, there's nothing there to make that kindness impure in any way whatsoever. It's a very pure and beautiful kind of kindness. Uh, so see if you can do something beautiful to an absolute stranger sometimes. Uh, and then you start to understand what metta actually is. Uh, you are kind to somebody here. Uh, you have no... It's a pure and beautiful type of kindness. Uh, and that feeling that comes inside of you when you're kind to a perfect stranger, that is... Uh, the direction in which metta is leading. That is what metta really is about, that kindness. And then later on, when you reflect on that beautiful act you did, you can actually bring that into your meditation to help you generate that sense of goodness and kindness inside of you. It's a wonderful thing. And I recently, when I went back to visit my parents in Norway, my mother told me a story that was very, very beautiful and very nice. And... I guess Norway is like every, everywhere around the world, you know, sometimes you have, there's lots of immigrants these days in Norway, just like there is in Australia. And some of these immigrants sometimes get a very hard time, you know, they come from like the, a culture you don't really like, you know, and they have the wrong religion and all these kind of things. And they have, a, and certain people often get a hard time. This is the way things seem to be around the world. And she said that one day she was, uh, uh, staying in, in my parents' apartment in, uh, in Oslo. Uh, and she said that uh, she needed to go down. She was going to take a bus somewhere. It was a long bus journey. Uh, and she was going to take a taxi to the bus station. So she goes down uh, 
And the taxi driver happens to be one of these foreigners. Uh, and straight away, you know, he speaks with a strange accent and looks foreign, all these kind of things. Uh, but that's fine. My mother is not very prejudiced, so she ha doesn't have a problem with that. So she gets into the car uh, and uh, she says, oh, please take me to the bus terminal or whatever it is. Uh, so they drive through the city. Uh, and then eventually they arrive at the bus terminal. Uh, and just as the uh, car is about to stop, my mother is about to open her bag and take out her wallet and to pay the driver, she realizes she has forgotten her wallet. She doesn't have a wallet with her. And she's panics and thinks, oh, what am I going to do? And she's about to say to the taxi driver, oh, I haven't got my wallet. And she's about to say that, you know, please take me back to my apartment so I can get my wallet. Uh, but before she has a chance to say that, he says, never mind. It doesn't matter. You can pay later on. Now is not important. He doesn't ask for any ID. He doesn't ask who she is, what her name is, nothing. All he says, you can pay later on. And of course, my mother is astonished. You know, here is one of these people who are usually kind of looked down upon as a bit dodgy in Norwegian society. And here is one person who is more kind than you know, by far anybody would normally be. He says, don't have to pay. What an amazing thing that is. And then she realized, well, if I haven't got my wallet, how am I going to get the bus ticket? It's a long journey. It's, it, the bus ticket is expensive. It's about $100 or whatever. So she says to the taxi driver, you know, I, this is hopeless. I, I can't even get a bus ticket. I can't, you know, go down to, the, to where I want to go. And he says, never mind, I'll give you the money for the bus ticket. And then he says, you know, again, you can pay this back later on. Doesn't ask for any ID, ask for nothing. Pay back at your own leisure. So he gives her, gives my mother a hundred dollars. <laughs> that is an amazing story. And I, it, is, it is one of those wonderful stories because these are the people who are kind of looked down upon as a bit dodgy in many societies, you know, a bit kind of, you're not really sure where they're at. And here, he is more kind, has more kindness in him, more uprightness in him, more generosity in him than almost anybody else you would find anywhere on this planet. What a beautiful thing that is. And my mother said that after that, she has this wonderful, positive view of, of these immigrants. Before, she didn't really know, but now this wonderful, positive view. One man can make such an incredible difference for how we look at the world and how we view other people. And this is the same here and now. Uh, if you do act of kindness, if you do something generous, good, kind to somebody you may have never seen before, you don't know what kind of impact that is going to leave on that person. Uh, sometimes when you do something beautiful, it leaves an impact in that person's mind, just like it left an, left an impact in my mother's mind. She's talking about this happened 10 years ago. He's still talking about it as if it's some kind of miracle from heaven. Uh, and the same thing will happen to you. And it raises people's spirits. It gives them a belief in humanity, a belief that there is something beautiful out there. So not only is it good for you, not only does it purify you, but sometimes these acts of kindness have such a powerful impact on the people around you. It makes people have a sense of belief in the world, that there is goodness out there. There's a good world we're actually living in. Very powerful, very beautiful. And, uh, but I think for me, when I think about kindness and goodness, one of the person that I always think of as maybe the kindest and good, most good person is somebody like Ajahn Brahm. I have lived with Ajahn Brahm at Bodhinyana Monastery for about 18 years now. I know him very, very well. And he is like, he's the abbot of the monastery, right? Been a monk for 40 years. He's a very, very senior monk by all standards. He's a very good meditator. His meditation is very profound. He's a teacher of thousands, tens of thousands of people. He's my teacher. He tells me what I should be doing. But Ajahn Brahm is the kind of person who will open the door for me and say, please walk through her. Ajahn Brahm is the kind of person when he sits there with his tea and he has, he has this tea with condensed milk. Everybody says you shouldn't be having so much condensed milk because it's bad for you. He doesn't care about such things. But what he says is that as soon as he had his condensed milk, he passes down to you. You too, please have some condensed milk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from kindness. It's so beautiful. And he will always do little act of kindness like that all the time. He is the most senior. He should be the most important person. And yet he is the one who does all the little act of, acts of kindness. How beautiful that is, 
How wonderful it is to have a teacher who has that kind of heart. And what, what does, why does he do this? You might think, you know, what, what, you know, what's the point? And the point, of course, is that for Ajahn Brahm, being kind, being good, gives him happiness. It sustains his meditation, and his meditation sustains his kindness. And the reason why his meditation is so powerful and so deep, and he really does have extremely deep meditation, the reason is precisely because of that kindness. So when you see somebody who you are inspired by, somebody you find to be unique, somebody who has powerful qualities, and for me, Ajahn Brahm is one of those people, then look at him and see, what is it? Why, how, what is it about this person that his meditation is so profound? And look at him, observe, and you will see things like I see, the kindness, the generosity that comes out of him naturally here. And when you observe that, you think, yes, this is why his meditation is so powerful. I should emulate the way Ajahn Brahm is happening or is working or doing things or any other teacher you have that is very powerful and very, uh, has very good meditation. Look at why, why the meditation is so powerful. Look at the kindness. Look at the goodness there and then try to emulate it. And when you emulate it, you too will be moving in the same direction here. So this is the, the power of that kindness. It actually takes you towards mindfulness and then good meditation later on. I'm always astonished at somebody like Ajahn Brahm, who, you know, you'd think that he would be full of himself and have a big ego, but he's the last person to have a big ego. He will take the most, you know, smallest Anagari kind of monastery and allow him to go first and give him something, say something kind. And what a wonderful example that is. And when... That happens when you start to develop this goodness in your life, when you start to act consistently with kindness as much as you can. There's a beautiful simile in the Buddhist suttas. These are the discourses by the Buddha. The beautiful simile to show you what happens when you do that. And this is the simile of the mountain. There's many beautiful mountain similes in the suttas, but this particular simile, it says that it's just like in the evening uh, when the sun is coming down uh, and you are sitting behind a big mountain and the sun goes down behind this big mountain. Uh, when that happens, the shade of that mountain envelopes you completely, envelopes your house and envelopes all the land around you. Uh, the shade becomes completely all-encompassing, the shade of that mountain as the sun is setting here. Uh, and in exactly the same way as, this, as a shade envelopes you completely at sundown, uh, in exactly the same way, uh, if you are a person who habitually does good, habitually is kind, uh, what happens is that those kindness, that goodness start to envelope you. Uh, and when you come, when you have finished a long day, maybe you are tired because you've been working very hard, uh, maybe you, uh, you, know, you have a family and all these kind of things, but eventually... At the end of the day, you sit down, maybe in your favorite chair or whatever it is, and you just take a breath and you sigh and you just relax after a hard day. What happens? The good actions come back to you. They envelope you. They come around you and you just feel a natural sense of goodness and happiness inside of you because of your goodness. And it's a beautiful simile here, how the goodness actually comes around you. And it's like your mind becomes permeated by that goodness. You don't have to really reflect on your good acts anymore. They become part of who you are, part of your personality here. Wonderful. I find that simile so inspiring and so beautiful myself. Think about that simile here. And then maybe that will help you a little bit and drive you in the right direction. Sometimes... In Buddhism, we talk about meditation techniques, some things like sila nusati. Sila nusati means like a recollection of your virtue and kindness. And chaga nusati is a recollection of your generosity, what you give to others. And these are like meditation techniques when you reflect on what you have done in the past. But sometimes you don't need to reflect all that much because if your life is permeated by the goodness, all you have to do is sit back and all the good memories come back to you, and you just feel naturally good. This is the ideal way of doing these sort of recollections. Just allow it to come into you, and wow, it is beautiful, and you feel really good. And it's a wholesome goodness, it's not an ego, it's not I am great, it's just a natural 
beautiful sense of goodness inside of you. Yeah. So that is the beautiful acts. Of course, the beautiful acts in life, uh, they also extend to speech. Speech is often more often difficult, uh, but again, extend it to speech as well. Say something nice to the people around you. Say something beautiful. Uh, it explains in the suttas how we should act in this way. And the Buddha says there's two things about uh, beautiful speech. First, it is speech that leads to harmony, speech that brings people together, that doesn't divide them. You don't say bad things about other people, uh, at least not normally. Or maybe occasionally it is right, it's the right time because you have to do it for whatever reason. But normally you say good things about other people. And in a Buddhist society, <coughs> excuse me, such as this, where people keep the five precepts, where people do good things, uh, it is very easy to see the goodness in the people around you. There isn't really much bad you need to say here. How wonderful it is to be with people like this. Say good, good things about the people of the Buddha society. Say good things about people around you. Create harmony, create cohesion, create unity, not division. This is one of the important things, important aspects of right speech. And when you do that, you also get at the same time a very beautiful Buddhist society which is harmonious and unified. People treat each other with care and kindness. And the other aspect of right speech in Buddhism and the suttas uh, is to speak words that go to the heart of other people, uh, words that are liked by many, uh, words that are uh, kind and generous, words that people want to hear. Uh, it's the opposite of harsh speech, opposite of the speech that is angry and negative. It's the speech that goes to the heart. And this is the other quality of right speech. To see if you can find that speech that actually goes to the heart of other people. And when you do that, you know what it's like. Sometimes there are people, when they speak, it's just always beautiful when they speak. It's like you know they're going to say nice things. And how beautiful it is to be around people like that. And you try to be the same. Try to be somebody who speaks beautiful words. And then you have the two aspects of right conduct. You have metta. You have loving kindness in action. You have loving kindness in speech. And then when you start to think about that, you think about what does it feel like to have loving kindness? What does it feel like to have goodwill in action and speech towards others? particularly when there's no vested interest whatsoever, it's a complete stranger. What is that feeling inside of you uh, when you do that? Uh, think about that feeling. That feeling is the beginning of the metta, that beautiful feeling when you just want to be kind to somebody else. That is the start of the metta practice. Uh, and you take that feeling, uh, and when you do your metta meditation, you sit down, you superimpose that feeling on whatever people that you want to have metta and kindness towards. And then, perhaps then, you can start to give rise to that feeling inside of you, the beautiful feeling of kindness towards others. May you be well and happy, you think, and you really mean that. When you give somebody a gift, when you're kind to somebody in speech, what are you doing? Basically, you are saying, may you be well and happy, right? Because you wish them happiness. Otherwise, you wouldn't be kind towards them. And then in your meditation, you're doing exactly the same thing. You're saying to the people, may you be well and happy. You're bringing that kindness back into your meditation that you developed outside. And then it really starts to work. And then you can actually do the metta meditation and it becomes powerful. One of the problems of metta meditation is always to actually give rise to a true feeling, yeah? not to just parrot, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be well. It doesn't really work, right? There was like somebody was saying here, I, I'm not sure if he's here today, huh? he was saying, oh, you know, metta meditation is a bit like fake it until you make it, I think he said. Huh? And sometimes it feels like that. It feels like you're trying to fake it. Huh? So the point is, let's, let's, sometimes you fake it a little bit to try to make it, but let's try to make it as much as possible without faking it. Huh? So, and of course, the point is, to be able to make it, it has to come from your heart, right? You really have to mean it. May you be well, may you be happy. May you be free of suffering. It has to come from your heart. Allow it to come from your heart. Remember the times in your life when you had this feeling inside. Bring it out and then say from your heart, may you be well and happy. Choose the right object. 
Choose a way that works for you. Try different things, try different people, try different directions and make it work. And say from your heart, truly, honestly, may you be well and happy. May you be free of suffering. And then wait. Don't say it all the time, just wait. And see if the feeling arises inside of you. And then when the feeling starts to arise inside of you, then you are doing the metta meditation. Then it is actually starting to work. And what a beautiful thing that is. And then when that metta starts to work, and when you go back out into the world again, and you have to do kind things, you have to say kind things, it is so easy because you already have so much goodwill inside of you. And then when it's easy to do the right things, when it's easy to say the right things, and it is so easy to go back and do the metta meditation. And you get this beautiful snowball effect. It's a very slow snowball. The Dhamma works slowly. It takes time. But it's a snowball nonetheless that gradually, gradually grows. Over the months, over the years, you become more and more pure. You have more and more kindness inside of you. You have more and more beauty inside of you. And things gradually, gradually become better and better. And then, the next time you go on the meditation retreat, and you sit down and you want to watch the breath or whatever it is, you find that your mindfulness is better than it was before. Your presence is more powerful. You're actually here. You can actually be, be around. You don't, your mind is not just scattered all over the place anymore. Once you have a, had a chance to calm down from your daily life, you find that mindfulness becomes powerful. And the reason is because of all the purification you have been doing in your daily life. And then six months later, you go maybe on another meditation retreat, and you try again, and you find your mindfulness again is more powerful, because the purity of your heart is even better than it was before. And this is how you can monitor yourself. This is how you can see whether that purity is actually is increasing, whether you are on the right path by going on regular meditation retreats and seeing if it is actually working for you. Gradually, gradually, you're moving in the right direction. And then it becomes such a beautiful path. It becomes so wonderful because you can see that change is happening inside of you. And when change is happening inside of you, the confidence in Buddhism becomes so much more powerful. These teachings actually work, for goodness sake. It's not just that you see some inspiring monk or nun or inspiring layperson who has practiced a long way. You see it in your own heart. Change is happening inside of you. Month by month, year by year. That is so powerful when you see that. The reason, I've been a monk now for 16, 17 years. And the only reason I'm still a monk is because I have seen a process happening inside of myself. I was completely hopeless when I first became a monk. But gradually, gradually, I become less hopeless. And, <laughs> and uh, that is a, what a wonderful thing that is, just to become less hopeless. It's a great thing to become less hopeless. <laughs> So, and, this is, and this is what you see inside of yourself, because less hopeless means more happy. Huh? You feel more happy, you feel more at ease, you feel more relaxed. Huh? And then the confidence comes, uh, the sense that Buddhism, work comes, and Buddhism works comes, and everything takes on a life of its own. And you are on the way uh, to uh, much benefit for yourself and also other people. Huh? Thank you. That's the talk for this evening. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask or comment on? Please do so. Huh? Okay. Thank you, John. Huh? Okay. Before I um, uh, take these questions from from various people. Uh, Around overseas, actually. Are there, is there anybody here who would like to ask something first of all? Huh? Give priority to the Nolamara crowd, our own people. Huh? <laughs> it's always nice. Huh? Anybody want to say anything here? Huh? Please don't be afraid of saying anything here. Huh? You're quite happy, everybody? Huh? Okay, great. Okay, good. So let's take the questions from overseas then. This is the first one, is from Misha in the U USA, huh? and says, How can one show metta towards oneself? Okay, that's a very good question. People often find this difficult. But remember that, first of all, if you 
have metta towards others, metta towards yourself usually also comes as part of that. Because metta is like a general attitude. If you have it towards others, you also will tend to have it towards yourself. So if you develop it towards others, it will come to yourself as well. But I think one of the most important things, one of the dangerous things in life, is that we often are so judgmental towards ourselves. We think, I should be doing better. I haven't kept my five precepts 100% pure. I made a tiny little mistake. Oh, I'm really bad. And this is sometimes the problem. We're too judgmental. But remember, and this is again this idea of the Buddhist idea of non-self. In the end, you're not really 100% in charge of yourself. There are all kinds of cause and conditions, past conditioning from your life when you were young, when you were a child, maybe from past lives, that drive you in a certain direction. And because it all drives you in a certain direction, it means that sometimes you are going to make mistakes. Remember that. It's not really so much your fault. It's not so much that you could have done anything different. Probably you couldn't. So accept that. Accept that that is part of the suffering of life. That sometimes you're going to make mistakes, right? And accept yourself. Forgive yourself. It's okay to make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes if you get angry with yourself, you just make it worse. And then because you, you get angry with yourself, then you... Uh, you sort of, uh, you don't like that anger. And actually, in my experience, anger just makes the whole knot, the whole knot of existence even more difficult to undo, so to speak. So anger doesn't work. Instead, have compassion for yourself and ask yourself, what can I do to avoid this in the future? Don't be judgmental. You're okay. You're doing wonderfully well. If you're already keeping the five precepts, wow, what a powerful thing that is in the world to keep the five precepts. If you do meditation practice to purify yourself, wow, what a wonderful thing that is in the world to do these things. Give yourself a break. Don't be so judgmental. If you're less judgmental of yourself, you will also be less judgmental of others. If you're less judgmental of others, you will be less judgmental of yourself. So ask yourself also, are you judgmental of other people? Don't be judgmental of other people. Uh, don't do that, because it's so hard to know what other people actually are like. You don't know why they do the things they do. Uh, and if you had understood the other person fully, uh, no doubt you would have forgiven that person. There's a French saying, apparently, which says that to understand everything uh, is to forgive everything. Uh, to understand everything is to forgive everything. Uh, when you understand somebody completely, you will always be able to forgive because you know why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. So try some of these things and then gradually you will be able to have more meta for yourself. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's go on to question number two. This is also from the USA. This is from Lee in the USA. How do I overcome the negative feeling I have towards a person I care, I care for who puts people down. Okay, well, again, this is, uh, uh, again, this is about not being judgmental, right? Uh, if somebody, somebody puts people down, uh, then often uh, what happens for such a person is that they will meet a lot of negative reactions and difficulties in life. They don't really understand what they're doing, probably. Uh, they are overcome by some sort of conditioning in the past that makes them do this. Uh, so don't feel negativity. Have instead a sense of compassion and sympathy. Somebody who acts like that, somebody who puts people down, is somebody who has a personal problem inside of them, something they're not really able to resolve. And see maybe if you can somehow help them to understand that they have a problem and that maybe they can make a change. Now the first step always to help somebody else is to accept them for what they are, not to judge them. If you judge them, if you don't accept them for what they are, if you don't understand that they are doing this against probably their own better judgment, if you understand that, you have sympathy and acceptance, it is much more likely that they will accept your advice and maybe even come to you and say, you know, uh, what can I do? What can I, you know, how can I change? So first thing is always acceptance. And then maybe you can do something towards that person to help them. Okay, so question number three. Uh, this is from uh, Kai Lee in Malaysia. Uh, 
What should one do when one has to work in a negative environment surrounded by unethical people? Is it right to just sit back and follow the unhealthy culture? Okay, well, it really depends on the circumstance. It depends on how strong your personal practice is, right? If you have a very strong personal practice and you are able to sort of in a sense, withstand the unhealthy environment. Maybe you have a few good friends who are on your wavelength that, that support you. Maybe you have a strong family that supports you. Maybe you have a Buddhist place you go to that supports you. If you feel that you are able to deal with the unethical environment and stay positive and actually maybe influence other people in a good way, then it is usually okay here. But if you feel that the opposite is happening, that you, in a sense, are drowning in that environment, you're not able to stand your own ground, you are losing yourself, losing your sense of ethics and kindness inside of you, then if that is happening, then you should always ask yourself, what is really important in life? Is it this particular job or is it my spiritual well-being? At the end of the day, the answer is so obvious. Of course, it is the spiritual well-being that really matters. What are you going to take with you when you die? What are you going to bring with you into the future? What is it that really makes you happy inside? Is it your state of mind or is it the external things? So when, you, you, when it is a matter of your own spiritual development and your spiritual development is actually being hampered by your surroundings, then try and see if you can actually change those surroundings. That is a perfectly val valid way of making a decision of doing something else. The only thing which matter matters in Buddhism is that we make progress on the Buddhist path. What matters is that we purify ourselves, that we grow in good qualities, and that we decline in bad qualities. That is all that matters. And all decisions we make in life should be made on that basis. It's a wonderful guideline for making decisions anything that all that matters is am i improving in good qualities and declining in the bad ones if you are that is the way you should go excellent criteria for deciding what to do in life criteria so i hope that works and if you um, uh, so see if, if you can work with that and hopefully that will be of help for you here so any Last questions before we call it a uh, evening here. Everybody happy here? Okay, great. So let us pay our respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. <laughs>